This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They, I it felt, felt I right. Right. But I was so And I just happy. thought, well... I figured it out. I it was that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from Emily Caudill. The story was recorded in July 2014 at the Bonnie Adaro Foundation in San Carlos, California. It was part of an evening of stories produced in partnership with Smart Patients, an online community where patients and caregivers learn from each other about treatments. I remember the first time that I noticed a difference. It was after my first cycle of chemotherapy. I was riding in the car with my younger sister, Abby. I had a list of jokes that I was reading to her from a a care package that someone had given me. I thought these jokes were hysterical, but Abby does not share my sense of humor. She was turning up the volume on the radio to drown me out. I said, wait, one more. What do you call a hundred banjos at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. Um, Abby just shook her head and said, "That seriously, that isn't even funny. When she spoke, I realized that the words that she said sounded different. It was a slight change, like I wasn't hearing all of the syllables. The S sounds were missing. I asked if she could hear that sound I was making, and she said, yes, she heard it, but I didn't. My own sound, I could feel the air passing through my teeth and the rattle of the to- my tongue on the back of my teeth, but I couldn't hear it. At 25 years old, I had been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Lingering injuries from a bicycling accident were masking a much more serious problem. A large, rare, aggressive, fast-growing germ cell tumor staged at 3C. Everything changed in my life so quickly, so drastically, that I didn't have any time to prepare. I was diagnosed on a Friday, and two days later, had surgery on a Sunday. I woke up in post-op with a 13-inch scar down my middle, and if I wanted to get better, chemotherapy had to be my immediate next step. I was holding on to this blind hope that maybe my treatment could fit nicely into my weekly planner after morning sessions at my music therapy internship or before an evening gig. The school year had just begun at the Bluegrass Academy for Autism where I was a paraprofessional and music group leader. I had big things planned that year for the students like songwriting to practice communication skills, Chemotherapy was not part of my plan, but cancer did not care about my schedule. My treatment was called BEP. It would require a five-night stay in the hospital every three weeks. It would definitely make my hair fall out. It may also cause pulmonary problems, neuropathy, blindness, other cancers, dry skin, hearing loss. Hearing loss? Oh, that should be the least of your concerns, they said. There's only a 10% chance, and if it happens, it's reversible. Considering that my life depended on it, I agreed that the benefit would outweigh the risk and began treatment. My family swooped in from out of town to take care of me. My mom never left my side. The walls of my hospital room were covered in cards from students and neighbors and even from strangers. My friends didn't allow me to sulk. They came to visit with guitars and books and Nerf dart guns. And we played and laughed and sang. And that was good because I wasn't ready to stare 
into the face of this monster. When my hair began to fall out, I called my little sister crying. And a few hours later, she showed up in my hospital room with a part of her head shaved and said, see, it's not so bad. At home, I would try to practice violin, but I was losing perception of those high-frequency overtones which are necessary for tuning. So I found myself sitting at the piano. That's where I wrote this song called Shiver. I recorded a video of it and posted it on the internet so that my friends and family far away could see that I was in good spirits. I shiver, I shake in the wake of the terrible news. A hospital bed under my head and I don't have any more time else for wasting on you. You cruel disease, what a tragedy they whisper. You can gather around me, but I ain't dying yet. Four months pass. 2011 was in the history books, and I was in remission. You know, I don't remember crying when they told me that it was cancer. But when my audiologist did a full hearing assessment and said that my hearing loss was permanent, I just sobbed. My ears were driving me nuts. Tinnitus was ringing around the clock now. Sometimes it sounded like a tonal cluster. The dissonance was so irritating. And occasionally, just one tone would sound in one ear or the other. And it would be so loud and so piercing like a siren that all I could do was stop everything and wait for it to fade. Whee! I kept playing in spite of this. I joined a roots band called Blunt Honey. They played the kind of music that felt like home to me. I went back to work as well, but my weakened immune system was no match for the physical demand of working with children, and it showed. Eight months into remission, a phone call confirmed that my cancer had relapsed. And my liver was now involved. My best shot this time would be a bone marrow transplant. It would require 12 months of recovery and would definitely make my hearing impairment worse. Now here's the game changer. I was offered a supreme opportunity to retreat from the world while I went through treatment and recovery. So I packed up my life in Louisville, gave up my job, put my internship on hold, and moved 200 miles away to the family farm in eastern Kentucky. Treatment did not go as planned. There were several unforeseen complications, liver failure and then kidney failure, which caused my body to swell with 40 pounds of fluid. The high-dose chemo was so devastating to my ears that people had to get in my face and yell for me to hear their words. But soon it didn't matter how loudly they yelled because everything began to get very fuzzy. I didn't understand speech anymore. I didn't recognize anyone, not my favorite nurses, not even my friend Jonathan, who sat at my bedside and played guitar and sang to me for hours. I even forgot my own name. I was having a mild hemorrhagic stroke. My transplant was terminated early. My case was considered unsuccessful. Scans were still showing spots. It was still in there. Dr. Metzinger said we could try a second look surgery, so we did. No one was prepared for the results. It was the best possible news. Those spots around my liver, they were inviolable. It turns out that my unsuccessful transplant might have been successful after all. It was over, it seemed I could go home. So I returned to the resort and rest home, that's what we call my grandparents' house, and dropped off the map for a while. 
for a year, I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't set an alarm clock. There were no expectations, just unconditional love, a soft bed, and my grandma's chicken and dumplings. For several months, I was too weak even to open a bottle of water, so practicing was totally out of the question. As I began to get stronger, I started talking to other people about my hearing loss, and I gathered so much strength and encouragement from their stories. My friend, a professional drummer, was deaf in one ear. A cousin has been wearing hearing aids his entire life, and I never knew. A neighbor has been dealing with tinnitus after a life working in a factory with loud machinery. I was not alone, but I still felt sorry for myself. And so I decided that I was going to quit music. I declared my plan to my family. And my grandpa, who was 81 and sharper than a tack, said, my girl, you must never quit. I knew that he was right. And I also knew that if I quit, I had to give up this instrument. You see, this fiddle has a story of its own. It was made by a man named Kleinard from Indiana in the year I was born, 1986. There's a snake rattler in the body to keep the devil out. Mr. Kleinard gave this fiddle to his student, Jeff, and several years later, I was a student of Jeff's. One day in a lesson, Jeff said, I've got this fiddle sitting in my attic. It needs to be played. Why don't you take it and play it, and you keep it as long as you're playing it? So I've been playing it for 10 years through music school, in rock bands, all across the country. It's even been played at Carnegie Hall when I called my old teacher to tell him that I was bringing back the Kleinard fiddle, he said, you quit? And I said, this instrument deserves a trip to the Grand Ole Opry, and I can't take it there. Jeff said, remember what I told you. You keep it as long as you're playing it. When we hung up, I unpacked this instrument. I rosined up my bow. And I played through one of my favorite old tunes. I couldn't even remember the rest of the tune, and my muscle memory was shot, but I tried to play another one. I was out of tune, but still, I, I tried to play another one. I couldn't ever imagine enjoying music the same way that I used to, but still something deep inside was saying, don't stop playing. So I set some goals. Practice for 20 minutes a day, every day. I set a timer and stood up and played long, slow bow strokes. And if I got to 20 minutes, I was done for the day. The highest octave sounded like a cat scratching on a chalkboard, but I played through it, and I came back to it anyway. Every day, I played it anyway. That was a year ago. Today, I'm wearing hearing aids, and I have um, a digital tuner clipped to my scroll so that I can see when the notes are out of tune, which is most of the time. I've had no evidence of disease now for 16 months. I miss the sound of rain. I miss that signature whistling melody when the Andy Griffith show comes on. I may always have to wear hearing aids. I may never regain feeling in my feet or be able to see myself in the face of my child. But as long as I'm here, as long as the sun comes up and I can hold a fiddle in my hands, I'm going to keep playing.
That was Emily Caudill. Emily is a songwriter and musician from Louisville, Kentucky. Emily believes that life is a song and the music is composed by our stories. When she isn't writing songs and stories, Emily enjoys playing fiddle on the front porch of her lakeside cabin in Kentucky. This is part of a special event of stories by cancer patients. You can hear them all at smartpatients.com slash stories. That's smartpatients, one word, dot com slash stories. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. Also, we depend on listeners like you for our support. If you love this podcast, please consider donating at storycollider.org slash donate. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Bonnie Adaro Foundation for hosting the show, to Smart Patients for being amazing partners, and to Emily for that music. Thanks for listening. Why don't more infant formula companies use organic, grass-fed whole milk instead of skim? Why don't more infant formula companies use the latest breast milk science? Why don't more infant formula companies run their own clinical trials? Why don't more infant formula companies use more of the proteins found in breast milk? Why don't more infant formula companies have their own factories instead of outsourcing their manufacturing? We wondered the same thing. So we made Byheart, an infant formula company on a mission to get a lot closer to the most super, super food on the planet, Breast milk. Our patented protein blend has more of the important and most abundant proteins actually found in breast milk. We're the first and only U.S. made formula to use organic, grass fed whole milk, not skim. We even conducted the largest clinical trial by a new infant formula company in a quarter century with clinically proven benefits like easier digestion, less spit up, and softer poops versus a leading infant formula. And we make our own formula in the USA and our very own factories in Iowa, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. Byheart, a better formula for formula. Learn more at byheart.com.